What a joy and a privilege it is on my part to be able to come and to have a part on this program. This school has meant and continues to mean so much to me. I'm thrilled because of the impact and the influence for good that it has throughout our area. And may the Lord help her to stand as she has in the past as a bulwark of faith in the midst of a troubled sea. There are many other things that I might like to say in regard to the school and in appreciation for being here. But our time is so precious. And let us focus upon the particular theme at hand on developing evangelistic spirit. If there's ever been a time in all the history of the church when we needed to have the total involvement, the unswerving loyalty, and the personal involvement of every member, then that time is now. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. But unlike a mighty army, she's made up entirely of volunteers who's permitted to do pretty much as they please. There are no draftees, slackers are seldom disciplined, sleepers are not court-martialed, and there's very few circumstances where the average member of the church looks up even on disobedience of gospel commands to be a very serious offense. All of the blessings of God belong to us in and through the church, but only in proportion as its membership exemplifies sincerity, consistency, fidelity, and loyalty to the cause of Christ. There are no blessings promised because of lukewarmness. There are no blessings promised for merely filling a pew in a church building or having your name on a church roll or for being one that is a critic of the work that others are trying to do. All of the blessings that God has for you as a child in his family is conditioned upon your faithfulness and your hard work in his kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, more of my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In Galatians 6 and verse 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for we shall reap in due season if we faint not. In Hebrews 6 and verse 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love that you've shown toward his name in that you've ministered unto the saints and do minister. All of this demands that we build a militant evangelistic spirit in congregations of the Lord's church today. There are three great passages that thrill my heart and challenge my heart in regard to this theme. The first is when Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy mind. The second is a little incidental statement in which David said in 1 Samuel 21 and verse 8, the king's business requires haste. And the third is in the language of Paul in Colossians 3 and verse 23, whatsoever you do, do it heartedly as to the Lord and not to men. If we're going to restore to it the evangelistic fervor of the New Testament church, then we've got a selling job on our hands. We must develop a new spirit. We must develop new attitudes. And some of the things to be involved in that will be these. First of all, we must reestablish the fact that the church is a place of work. In Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Too long we've allowed the idea to prevail among the Lord's people that the church is like a dormitory in which people are to sleep rather than like a vineyard in which activity is to take place. And so as in a race we are to run. In Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2, wherefore seeing that we're compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he is set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He said that we are to run, but truthfully, many of us are not really walking spiritually, much less running in doing something for Jesus, but as in a ministry we are to strive. It's like a ministry that verses 1 through 7, there, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou unto faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has called him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Consider what I say, and the Lord shall give thee understanding in all things. And then, as a soldier, we are to fight. In First Timothy 6, uh, or 5 and verse 16, he said, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou wast called and did it profess a good profession in the sight of many witnesses. But in the church, we have summer soldiers and sunshine patriots who for the most part have never yet blooded a sword in defending the cause of Jesus or in fighting against the powers of Satan. But both Jesus and Paul are examples of work. In John 9 and verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that, sent, that him that sent me while it is day. For the night cometh when no man can work. Concerning Paul, in Acts 20 and verse 20, he said, I've kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. And in verse 31, he said that you are to watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to labor night and day with tears. Is it any wonder that we have so many weak, anemic members of the church in our generation when so many have never yet really engaged in spiritual exercise? Oh, because exercise, spiritual exercise, is designed to strengthen God's children. In First Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, but refuse profane an old wife's fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. But, uh, but he said bodily exercise is profitable for little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. And Jesus emphatically emphasized that a failure to work will actually condemn the soul. In John 15, verses 1 through 6, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh it away. But every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bear more fruit. Now you're clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same beareth much fruit, but without me ye can do nothing. If in a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and he is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But again, if we're going to develop a militant evangelistic spirit for Jesus, there are other things that are naturally going to have to be involved as well. Because if we're going to develop that kind of spirit, we must build every program within the church on the basis of hard work and sacrifice for the Lord. We must sell every member of the body of Christ on the idea that ours is a religion of conviction and not a religion of convenience. It's not a matter of doing something for Jesus in your spare time. 
It's a matter of giving up and sacrificing something else in order to be of real service to him. God expects full commitment, real dedication, and he will accept no less than that. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be ye not conformed to the things of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind to do that which is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. And then listen to Jesus. In Matthew 16, 24 through 26, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. He that shall find his life shall lose it, and he that shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. What shall it profit a man? Though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul, uh, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, and yet we've been afraid uh, to ask our members to do their very best uh, to make real sacrifices for the Lord. Down through the years, we've sympathized, and elders of the church have sympathized with the lazy and the lukewarm. We've geared most of our programs up for half-hearted commitment and for limited dedication because we already know that that's about what we might expect to receive. Up. We need to sell a, a different attitude of service under the Lord. Up. We need to expect more and let members know that we expect more than what they have been giving. Now, friends, in order to do this, we're going to have to get and develop, I believe, a different attitude sometimes within ourselves. We need to recognize that our young people today are looking for something to which they can give their very lives in the generation in which we now live. But do you remember the TV commercials that were run for the Job Corps just a few years ago when they said, we have a hard job that needs to be done and it's going to require 14 to 16 hours of every day in some of the most unbelievable living conditions uh, with a minimum of support in some of the most remote areas of the world. Uh, but it's an opportunity to be of real service uh, and surprisingly, they got more volunteers than they could ever accept. Uh, at least three to every one that they could ever accept. Uh, year after year after year, they got more volunteers than they could ever accept. Uh, and I believe that we insult the intelligence of Christian people in the very way in which that we ask them to do something for the Lord. Uh, you know, we timidly approach a member of the church with the suggestion, here's a job that really needs to be done for the Lord and for the church, and then we immediately assure them, now it's not very hard. It'll not take much of your time. It'll not cost you anything. Uh, just anyone ought to be able to do it. It doesn't take much intelligence, and that's why we thought about you. <laughs> that's about the way we approach members of the church today. Why in this world don't we let them know that we expect their very best uh, and that God will never be satisfied with anything less than that. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ and nevertheless I live and yet Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. But again, if we're going to build a real evangelistic spirit in the congregation where we are, then we must urge members uh, to fully and faithfully support every work program that has been approved by their elders, uh, that they are to be working active members uh, and not bystanders. Uh, more than anything else, spectator itis is killing the church in our generation. Do you remember hearing of the coach who said that he knew a man who could play baseball better than anyone else? He was one of these unique kind of fellows 
that could play every position on the team. He just knew that he could catch the ball better and he could throw it farther than anyone else. And he was one of these fellas that he just felt sure could bat 800 on the major leagues. But there was just one problem. And do you know what it was? He couldn't get that multi-talented individual to lay down his hot dog and come down out of the grandstands onto the playing field. And in every congregation, we have Monday morning quarterbacks who are talking a great game. We have armchair directors who basically are observing and criticizing the work that others are trying to do. Somehow, we must involve our membership. We must get them out of the grandstands and onto the playing field. We must impress upon them that we have become Christians, not to get, but to give, not to be served, but to serve others. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28, you know that the princes of the Gentiles have dominion over them, and they that are great among them exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. He that would be greatest among you, let him be your minister. He that would be chief among you, let him be the servant of all. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for all. But again, if we're going to be the dynamic force for good that we'd like to be in our communities, we're going to have to talk the church up instead of down at every possible opportunity. These members that go out on a visitation program supposedly to win the lost and spend all their time running down the church and its leadership invariably hurt the church. And we've seen it happen over and over again down through the years. People actually go out with us on a visitation program and spend all of their time in that home telling about what they don't like about the elders or the deacons or the preacher or the song leader. What's wrong with our Bible classes? What's wrong with our programs of work? Or how unforgiving and how uncaring some other member of the church is. Now listen, friends. Nobody in the world would want to be a member of the kind of congregation that that person is projecting unto others. We must develop congregational loyalty, congregational pride within the hearts of our members. We must develop within them a we feeling. Do you realize that any congregation is already in trouble? When the members began to talk about what they are doing, rather than about what we are doing. You listen to the members of your congregation and find out how often you hear them saying, well, they did this and they did that, and they're planning to do this and they're planning to do that. And usually it's in the context that I don't really like what they're doing and I don't like what they're planning to do. But when you began to develop the spirit uh, that a visitation program becomes our visitation program, and a Christian outreach group becomes our Christian outreach group, and a meeting becomes our meeting, and the budget becomes our budget, and it's an entirely different story. What marvelous potential we can have if we can develop a we feeling in the part or in the heart of every member. And the early church had that spirit. For in 1 Corinthians 12, 25 through 27, that there should be no division in the body, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Whether one member rejoice, then all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And back in verse 20, he said there are many members and yet but one body. And that unity and that oneness and that fellowship is so essential to developing an evangelistic spirit. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2, 
I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But if we're going to develop within the heart of our members an evangelistic spirit, that will cause them to be great soldiers of the cross. Uh, we must learn that a working, active membership uh, is to be developed within them. We're to begin to act and talk as if a working, active membership is the expected thing. It is to be the rule and not the exception among the Lord's people. Now, I like to try to sell members of the church on the idea that when you really love the Lord, you're going to want to work for Him. No one's going to have to beg or plead or command or coerce. If you really love the Lord, you're going to want to work for Him. In First John 5 and verse 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. In John 14 and 15 in the Revised Version, it represents Jesus as saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And we've tried down through the years to make it harder in every passing year to be a deadhead in congregations where I've served. And you know, their time was when it was surprisingly easy in almost every place. I can remember times and circumstances in which the elders and I would always look sort of startled at any time that a member of the church ever volunteered to do anything. We just knew that either he's a nitwit or a new member, one or the other. But you know, I thank God it's not that way anymore. We now have members who are looking for an opportunity to volunteer to do something for Jesus. And with that spirit, we can say as David did in Psalms 119 and verse 60, I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. But if we're going to build a militant evangelistic spirit for Jesus. Uh, we must keep our members under constant pressure, not in the sense of forcing or compelling or coercing them to do anything, but only in the sense of motivating them to do greater things for God than they thought was humanly possible before that time. We still get the most from our members through definite assignments. It's true even in the church that everybody's business is nobody's business, and therefore we must be specific in causing them to feel personal responsibility for the ongoing progress and for the growth of the Lord's kingdom where we are, and especially we must make them personally responsible for being soul winners. In John 15 and verse 8, herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so shall you be my disciples uh, in the restoring of the wayward. In Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, uh, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Uh, in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16, Take heed to thyself, and to thy teaching, continuing these things. For in so doing, thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. But do you realize that a large percentage of the members of our congregations have never done any personal work? A large percentage have never really done any soul winning at all. And do you know why? It's basically that they've never somehow been made to feel personally responsible for it. And they always think of it as being the work of someone else to do. And so we must sell the very vital principle of Romans 14 and verse 12. So then every one of us must give an account of himself unto God. But if we're going to keep evangelistic spirit alive, uh, we must help our members to avoid discouragement. Uh, otherwise, it will destroy their potential for good. Uh, it is the greatest weapon, the most powerful weapon that Satan has. Satan 
destroys four or more members of the church through discouragement than he ever does through open warfare. And also, it is the only sin for which we are promised nothing at all in return. You'll understand, I believe, that almost every sin brings you some kind of reward, some kind of pleasure. The drunkard receives something even for his drunken depravity. The immoral reprobate receives something for which at least in that moment of time he's willing to sell his eternal soul. But discouragement brings nothing but more discouragement. Depression leads only to deeper depression. Now, God has given a wonderful promise. In Isaiah 55 and verse 11, So shall it be with my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return into the void. It shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereunto I have seen it. Now, every work has its hills and its valleys. Every work, even for the Lord, is never going to go continually uphill. We all have our backsides. We all have our disappointments. And we all see some members of the church who simply do not intend to work for Jesus. We see some who seem determined to live impure lives. And, and you could be terribly discouraged by that. And yet, the Christian is an incurable optimist. But why? Basically, because God is his helper. In Romans 8 and 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And in verse 31, Nay, but in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that has loved us. And two of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is found in Isaiah chapter 41. Now, in verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, I will help thee, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, and then in verse 13, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, now, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. And try to think, of all the Christians that have been helped and strengthened and encouraged by the reading of Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation or your manner of life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. As he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. What man shall do unto me? And then perhaps more than anything else, if we're going to build that militant evangelistic spirit for Christ, uh, we must dedicate our own lives uh, fully and completely under the Lord's will. Uh, and when we do that, uh, then we could not be less uh, than he would have us to be. The poet raised the question of what is the yielded life. Tis one at God's command for him to mold, to form, to use, to do with as he may choose, uh, resistless in his hands. Uh, what is the yielded life? Tis one whose only will, when into blessed subjection brought, uh, of every deed and aim and thought, seeks just to do his will. Uh, what is the yielded life? Tis one that love has won, and in surrender full complete, uh, lays all with gladness at the feet of God's most holy Son. That Paul said in First Timothy 4 and verse 6, If thou shalt put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, uh, nurtured up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Uh, may God help and guide each one of us to build a militant evangelistic spirit uh, for the Lord in the congregation right where we are. Thank you for listening.